All right, so today we're going to talk about what we can learn about neuroscience tools from Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And this is a wonderful movie, and in a moment I'm going to get out of the way so that we can watch it. Um, it has an important plot point, which I'm not giving anything away because it's on all the ads. It says, <laughs> you can erase someone from your mind, right? And so the question that I want to start out with this evening is, can you erase someone from your mind? What currently available techniques might allow something like that? What can we know about how we might be able to do that in the future? Um, essentially, how much of this movie is science and versus science fiction, right? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So the company that erases people from minds in the movie is called Lacuna. And they have a process, which, again, I'm not giving anything away here, really, um, because this happens very early in the movie. They, their logo is, remember, with Lacuna, you can forget. It's a memory management company. And they have two steps to their process. Step one is they identify the location of the brain function, that is the specific memory that you want to remove. And then step two, they remove that brain function, that specific memory. And for those of you who, like me, have to look up the word lacuna, I know it's a word, and it means an unfilled space or interval or a missing portion of a book or manuscript. So this is a perfect name for this company, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk very briefly about what we know about current techniques that could do these things. Step one, identify the location of a brain function, and step two, remove that brain function. So, step one, lacuna localizes where the memory is stored in the brain. And this is an image of the machine that Joel, this guy, is in as the localization procedure is happening. So, what they do is they show him various objects. They show him a mug, they're showing him these potatoes, which have memories associated with them. And then they're looking at the brain areas associated with each of those memories. So then they find the parts of the brain that Lacuna is going to target in order to remove the memory. So their conceit is that this machine can find what brain regions are associated with each of those memories. And actually, this localization function is really not that unlike modern brain imaging techniques. So there's Joel in our movie. And this is a really, truly legit picture of a magnetoencephalography machine, or MEG. So you can see some similarities. There's this thing around the top of his head, her head, and she's sitting in the MEG machine. It's a completely painless procedure. We do it with babies, and babies are very happy in there. Um, so the MEG and several other techniques allow us to identify what brain areas are active during performance of a given function. So there are many types of, of techniques that are like this, and I'm just going to go through a few of them really quickly, just by name. One of them is called positron emission tomography, and on the left there are pictures of what kind of brain images you might get from a PET scan. And on the right is what it looks like when a person is in the PET scanner, right? This is functional magnetic resonance imaging. These are images, they actually came from our lab. And there's our scanner, that's the scanner that's right down the street at UAB in the Civitan International Neuroimaging Lab. Um, all of these techniques are similar in that they allow you to localize where in the brain different um, functions are um, being performed. Um, I'm going to focus on functional MRI because it's my favorite, because it's what I do in my lab, and um, we can talk about others if you have questions later. 
So with functional MRI and all these techniques actually, it's kind of like a movie. So we take a lot of different images um, over time, kind of like this. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, you can see my mouse. Okay, so we're gonna take a movie of functional MRI images. So we're seeing how the signal that we measure here, which has to do with neural activity, changes over time. And then we correlate these changes with tasks or stimuli or behaviors or whatever we want. So for example, here is our movie. We're recording brain activity in your brain. And then we show you a stimulus, in this case, a star, right? And then there's some change in your brain activity, which I'm representing by this little blue dot, right? We do it again, we show you a star. And then there's another blue dot, right? So we're looking at what changes are time-locked to the presentation of the stimulus. So by manipulating the timing of these stimuli, we can examine lots and lots of different things. We can examine neural responses to stimuli, we can, expand, we can examine changes in these neural responses after, for example, a person is trained on a task. The sky's the limit. There's literally thousands of people across the world that are doing different variants of this kind of thing. And this is an image that comes from the lab looking at um, responses to a simultaneous visual and auditory stimulus. There's um, activations in the visual cortex and in the auditory cortex. I'm not going to tell you more about what we're doing in the lab, but we are recruiting participants. If you'd like to participate in those studies, um, you can go to this website. We have lots of opportunities for um, being in some functional MRI studies. So we essentially are looking at what parts of the brain are responsive to different kinds of stimuli. In this case, visual or auditory stimuli, but we could use, for example, Pictures of your ex-girlfriend, right? That's what they do in the movie. So there are some similarities between our current techniques and what they talk about in the movies. We can localize what parts of the brain are used for a given process. Currently, we can see parts of the brain that are down to about two millimeters on a side. So that's pretty small, but it's not like one cell. We're not able to do that in humans yet. Very well. The differences are that the parts of the brain that would show up as responsive to memories of Clementine, the ex-girlfriend in the movie, would also show up as responsive to a lot of other things too. So the same cells are not gonna be responsive just to one thing. So we can't localize something as specific as a single memory um, or a specific memory of one person. Memory is very complex and it's multifaceted and the current techniques don't allow us to get down to the level of resolution that we would need for that, and maybe memory itself doesn't allow that. Okay, so that's step one. So we're pretty okay at identifying general locations of some brain functions. Step two is to remove those brain functions or a specific memory. So let's talk about that. This is what they do in the movie. So they have a different machine that Joel lies down in and they remove his um, brain function. So they, they basically zap out all the memories of Clementine. So step two is not completely unlike modern brain stimulation techniques, except modern brain stim stimulation techniques that are used in humans don't permanently do anything. Be, be very clear about that. There is nothing permanent to any of the modern techniques that we use. So they include things like transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is an image of someone undergoing TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. You can see that this is the person who is undergoing TMS. Here's an image of their brain. And this back here is called a TMS coil. This is a schematic of that TMS coil. And so it uses magnetic fields to disrupt activity of neurons in the cortex. So basically we induce these magnetic fields in this TMS coil, which changes the magnetic fields inside the brain, causing a disruption of neural activity in that area. So what happens is 
if you apply TMS to the part of the cortex that's responsible for speech, it causes disruption of speech. TMS to visual cortex can cause the experience of seeing a phosphine, that is a light that isn't there. So we're disrupting the function of these different parts of the cortex. That sounds kind of similar to what they're trying to do in step two of the lacuna process. But real brain stimulation techniques aren't really like lacuna. This, there are similarities. We can disrupt activity in particular locations in the human brain. But the differences are that brain stimulation techniques don't last long. And these changes are not precise, like removing a memory of a single person. We, we can't do that kind of thing yet. There's another type of thing that um, step two can sort of be like, and that is lesions. So generally, we don't have very precise control of lesions, but there are a few ways that humans do get brain lesions, and I'm sure you can think of several. Um, by and large, they, they aren't good, right? So for example, strokes. Strokes can cause brain lesions, right? They cause a part of the brain no longer to work. Strokes stop a portion of the brain from working, and they result in specific deficits in many cases. So there's a classic um, sort of set of information that you should all know, um, and that is you can spot a stroke based on some warning signs. So oftentimes you'll have a drooping face or arm weakness, speech difficulty. The reason that you get these specific um, responses to a stroke is because specific parts of the cortex have been influenced by that stroke, right? And just to complete this thought, time is very important in stroke, so if you see these things, you should get to the hospital as quickly as possible. So, Lesions in particular parts of the brain result in specific deficits. And some of the specific deficits that are a little less common than the ones I just described that can happen after focal brain lesions include an inability to recognize faces. So for example, prosopagnosia is the word for it, and it happens after a lesion of the fusiform face area. People with prosopagnosia might know you very well, but wouldn't recognize you walking down the street. You can also have an inability to orient attention to one side of space. That's called hemianopsia. It's due to a lesion of the right parietal lobe around here. And people who have hemianopsia just can't see, can't, can't orient themselves to things in one side of their visual field. They just, it's as if it's not there. We can also have an inability to make new long-term memories following amnesia due to a stroke or a lesion of the hippocampus bilaterally. So this kind of lesion wouldn't cause a specific deficit like forgetting Clementine, right? It would cause a problem with, with creating any kind of new memories, new long-term memories in general. So I think that um, Charlie Kaufman, who wrote this movie, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, probably had these kinds of very specific deficits in mind when he was thinking about what it was that Lacuna could do. Because right now, some of the things that our neuroscience tools can do, well, they verge on science fiction, right? We can identify parts of the brain that are important for brain functions, and then we can directly modify brain activity. That's amazing. It's almost science fiction. But scientists have been developing and using these neuroscience tools for a long time, for well over 100 years. This is an image of somebody that we call the father of modern neuroscience sometimes. His name is Ramon Cajal. And here he is in his lab. He was born in 1852. He made an image, this image right here, of a pyramidal neuron, which is a very important type of cell in the cortex. 
And this, this image was made around 1900. So we're talking a really long time ago, right? This was the state of the art at the turn of the last century. And we've been moving forward slowly, but moving forward since then. The tools of neuroscience, they're still evolving. We can identify brain areas involved in certain functions. We can use them to investigate how we're able to learn, how to make that learning more effective. We can study how the brain goes wrong in certain diseases. We can study how to make those diseases better. But we cannot precisely identify or completely remove brain functions or memories at the level of precision that lacuna does. And I, I doubt we ever will. Because I don't think that that is the way that the brain is organized. And I think the movie really gets at that. We're about to watch it. And I think, please pay attention to, to that point, see if you agree with me. I think one of the major themes of the movie is that memories for the people we love are intertwined with the memories that make us who we are. So that means that you can't remove Clementine without also removing vast swaths of the rest of memory, including who Joel is, right? You can't remove one piece without of, of, of memory without removing all the pieces it's touching. And that's a lot, right? So the, the movie itself, I think, is really a love story about two people, about how your interactions with another person really are what makes you who you are, right? But more than that, I think this movie is also a love story to neuroscience. Because fundamentally, it's your neuroscience that makes you who you are. And now we're ready for the movie. Thank you. 